Okay, so I think we'll um, make a start. Good morning, everybody. My name is, uh, as you can see there, uh, Nick Cavanagh. Actually, it's a great um, pleasure and indeed honour for me to um, chair this um, session and introduce um, the, the panel that we have. Um, the, the aim of this session is very much, as you can see from the title, uh, the urban in context and histor historical perspectives. And really what it is seeking to do is to look at various um, aspects and historical examples of the urban environment and really to answer the question, what makes the urban environment different and challenging? It's very much building on the, the great foundation um, laid by Sir Anthony Beaver's um, presentation and really then sets the context for this afternoon, which will be about lessons from contemporary operations and then looking towards the future. So this is very much about setting that broader context on which we will build um, this afternoon. Um, all of the speakers' um, biographies are in the, um, uh, the pack that you got this morning, so I won't do a long introduction to each of them. Um, but I would just briefly like to introduce um, Professor um, Peter Mansour, um, who is the uh, General Raymond E. Mason Chair of Military History at Ohio State University. Um, Professor David Betts, who's um, Professor of War in the Modern World in the War Studies Department of King's College in London. Uh, Virginia Camoli, um, who's a senior fellow for security and development um, in the International Institute for Strategic Studies, uh, and Wolf Owen, um, who is uh, an ex-army officer who consults widely of issues of defence and security, uh, is, is an ex-army, British Army, um, and consults widely on issues of defence and security and, and is the editor of the I Infinity Journal. Um, the format for the session will be uh, four short presentations from um, the speakers, uh, followed by a question answer session, uh, which will finish at 1200, 1200 hours for lunch. So without further ado, um, Peter, I'll hand over to you. Well, thank you, General Nick, and uh, thank you to the Royal United Services Institute for the kind in, in invite to uh, speak. It's my first time here, and um, I learned that my old boss, General Petraeus, was the recipient of the Chesney Gold Medal, and um, so I wrote him a note yesterday, and he wanted to make sure that I conveyed his, uh, his greetings to the Institute, uh, and he had very kind words to say about, uh, about uh, what's going on here. So uh, let's get into it. With a few exceptions, and I know at least one of the panelists will disagree with me, Urban warfare is a modern phenomenon. Before the 20th century, most urban battles involved sieges, with fighting occurring on the periphery of fortified areas. Siege operations were engineering endeavors to breach the fortifications surrounding urban communities. Once a breach occurred, surrender or sack followed. Armies maneuvered for advantage in open terrain or used urban fortifications as linchpins of defense but until urban warfare came of age in the 20th century, there was little actual fighting inside cities. World War II changed this dynamic. In that conflict, armies fought in cities for a number of reasons, and this gets to one of the questions that was asked this morning. To attack or defend prestige objectives, as Sir Anthony uh, Beaver so eloquently showed with the case, was the case at Stalingrad, to seize logistical centers, as was the case with the battles for Cherbourg and Brest in 1944, or to exact the last drop of blood against invading forces, as was the case in the battles for Manila and Berlin in 1945. Since then, history has recorded urban battles in Seoul, Budapest, Wei, Grozny, Beirut, Mogadishu, Sarajevo, Fallujah, Basra, Baghdad, and most recently, Mosul and Raqqa. Due to increasing urbanization, military forces in the future will be increasingly tested by this difficult war fighting environment. So what makes it so challenging? And I would posit that there's three factors that make urban warfare very difficult. The terrain, the people, and the very unique requirements for military forces operating in urban areas. First, the terrain. Densely built up terrain, the concrete jungle of modern cities makes for one of the most challenging environments for military forces to negotiate. Fields of fire are limited, putting a premium on close combat capabilities and in part negating the superior capabilities 
of more technologically advanced armored forces, as we heard this morning. Urban warfare is three-dimensional, with fighting above ground in multi-story buildings, at ground level in streets and alleys, and below ground in basements, tunnels, and sewers. Defenders can rig houses or buildings for detonation and use booby traps and mines to slow an advance on their positions. The fighting in Manila in February 1945 illustrates the difficulties of fighting in urban terrain. In a document I found during my research in the U.S. National Archives, the 1st Cavalry Division, a cavalry unit that had been stripped of its horses and sent to the Pacific to fight the Japanese, examined the tactics used to attack reinforced concrete structures. A squadron of approximately 700 soldiers, so a battalion, would attack a multi-story building as a single objective. Direct lay artillery fire would target known or suspected enemy positions. Supporting machine gun and rifle fire would target windows and doors to suppress enemy gunners. An assault team would then use demolitions to blow an entrance into the building through an exterior wall. Assault troops would enter the structure to clear it room by room. And it gave an example, the attack on Rizal Hall, a three-story reinforced concrete building on the campus of Philippine University on 20 February 1945. And this illustrates these tactics in action. Two cavalry troops in nearby buildings provided suppressive fire, along with mechanized and armored attachments that consisted of eight Sherman tanks, eight M10 tank destroyers, and two M7 105 self-propelled howitzers. Preparation fires began on the building at 0700 hours and continued for two hours. Assault teams then attacked and gained entry into two rooms on the ground floor, but encountered Japanese bunkers that controlled the corridors. The assault team used a rocket launcher to neutralize the closest bunker, while tank fire eliminated the other two bunkers that were only 30 meters away from the attacking troops and enabled the assault teams to move up the stairwells. The rest of the platoon then entered the building and began to clear it. Sniper fire delayed the attack. The building was a hollow rectangle enclosing a courtyard so a sniper on one interior window could target movement in the opposite wing of the building. As the attack reached the third floor at 1700 hours after eight hours of close combat, the Japanese detonated a large charge of explosives that collapsed the center part of the building 25 U.S. soldiers were wounded and had to be evacuated, which brought the attack to a halt. So if we think that rigging houses for demolition is a thing that just happened in Iraq, it's happened before. The troops established positions inside the building for the night, which the Japanese attacked with machine gun, and grenade, machine gun fire and grenades. The following morning, the attack recommenced. As the assault picked up pace, American soldiers found the corpses of 77 dead Japanese soldiers who had committed suicide during the night. By 1,300 hours, after 30 hours of fighting, the building was cleared. U.S. troops found a total of 303 dead Japanese inside. It was then on to the next building. Next, the people. Civilians generally do not have a death wish and will vacate an urban battle zone at the first opportunity. The brigade I commanded in Iraq, the 1st Brigade, 1st Armored Division, discovered this during fighting in Karbala in May 2004. For two and a half weeks, an armored battalion task force wrested control of the city away from the control of Shiite militiamen. When the fighting concluded, we offered to render salatia payments to any civilians who had been unintentionally killed or injured in the fighting. There were none to be found. The people in the vicinity had wisely decided to move out of the area when the fighting began. Similarly, U.S. forces allowed the population of Fallujah to decamp prior to the assault on the city in November 2004. Although 60% of the city was damaged or destroyed, non-combatant casualties in that assault were minimal. But the civilian population offers, suffer, often suffers terribly from urban warfare. Sometimes civilians are forced by violence or circumstances to remain and endure the bloodletting. Japanese forces in Manila raped, killed, and mutilated tens of thousands of Filipino civilians during the fighting for the city in February 1945. More recently, ISIS forced Iraqi and Syrian civilians to remain in Mosul and Raqqa 
as the battles for those cities raged. In part, this barbarism is meant to blunt attacks due to concern over non-combatant casualties, but often defenders know they are going to die anyway and just want to take as many of the local inhabitants as possible with them to their graves. This increases the body count and therefore the propaganda value of the carnage. And finally, the very unique requirements for military forces in urban environments. In urban fighting, numbers of troops and their quality both matter. This is part of what makes urban warfare so difficult. When a single building can consume an entire battalion of troops in a day's fighting, it doesn't take advanced calculus to figure out that an attacking force will soon run out of troops when facing a formidable opponent entrenched in an urban jungle, as the Germans discovered at the grain elevator and the tractor factory in Stalingrad. Attacking forces can improve their odds by paying attention to two major factors that have made military forces successful in urban operations in the past. First, the urban battle is not an infantry fight. It is a combined arms fight. The integration of all arms, among them armor, infantry, engineers, field artillery, and aviation, is essential to providing attacking forces the capabilities and firepower needed to prevail against a determined enemy. The battle for phase line gold in Sadr City in April 2008 is an ex excellent example of combined arms in action. The battle was precipitated by the Jaysh el Mahdi, which launched rockets into the international zone from its sanctuaries in Sadr City. To stop the attacks, ground forces would have to seize control of the launch sites, most of them southwest of Al Qud Street or Route Gold as it was marked on US military maps. And I didn't pay the speaker this morning, the questioner this morning to raise this example, um, although it was a great segue. From March 26 until mid-April 2004, US and Iraqi forces seized the terrain southwest of Route Gold. Jay El Mahdi militiamen defended their turf and although they were nowhere near as well-trained or equipped as the soldiers whom they faced, Within a week, they had destroyed six striker combat vehicles with rocket-propelled grenades. U.S. commanders decided to reinforce the strikers with M1A1 Abrams tanks and M1, M2A2 Bradley infantry fighting vehicles. The tanks, which could withstand the punch from rocket-propelled grenades that the striker combat vehicles could not, provided the overmatch that U.S. troops needed to remain in the area. Nevertheless, Militia fighters could still infiltrate through the worn of streets and alleyways to ambush American and Iraqi forces. To secure the area against enemy attacks, American and Iraqi leaders decided to erect a four kilometer long cement barrier along Route Gold. The wall took nearly a month to complete, but it decided the outcome of the battle. From mid-April to mid-May, US engineers installed nearly 3,000 large cement barriers. The Jaysh el Mahdi fought back ferociously as militia leaders understood the completion of the wall would limit their ability to get to the areas from which they could most accurately hit the international zone with mortars and rockets. This would in turn reduce their influence on political developments in Baghdad. Militia fighters planted 300 roadside bombs of which 120 exploded against US armored vehicles. On particularly bad days, only eight slabs of concrete went up. But this was exactly the kind of fight US forces could win in a walkover. Navy SEAL sniper teams augmented the ground forces. US Air Force fighter jets and armed Predator drones, along with US Army Apache attack helicopters, provided close air support. American soldiers countered militia snipers with more than 800 rounds of tank fire, and more than 12,000 rounds of 25 millimeter chain gun fire. A variety of high-tech instruments were employed to overwhelm the enemy, but the key was improved intelligence that flowed to the units and leaders directly in the fight. Colonel John Hort of the 3rd Brigade 4th Infantry Division had access to vastly more reconnaissance assets than entire divisions had at the start of the war in 2003. Shadow unmanned aerial vehicles and other intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance assets identified and tracked militia fighters, while armed predator drones and Apache attack helicopters launched Hellfire missiles to destroy them. By mid-May, the Jay Shalmati was a spent force, its rank and file decimated, 
and its leaders either dead, in hiding, or in self-imposed exile in Iran. These um, pictures here are from my brigade's fight in Karbala in uh, May of 2004. The one on the upper left is particularly interesting. It's a AC-130 gunship that I had called in firing on the Jay Shalmati headquarters, which was right across the street from the shrine of the Imam Hussein, the second holiest shrine in Shiite Islam. And if you think the pucker factor was high, that we were going to destroy the shrine, it was. And it makes my point that in urban warfare, it is not firepower that matters, but precision firepower. Mass firepower just creates rubble, and rubble can be defended, as German forces found out at Stalingrad and Allied forces in Italy discovered at Monte Cassino. U.S. forces in the battles for Brest and Aachen in 1944 used direct lay artillery to destroy German urban strongholds a much more effective technique than simply dumping tons of shells on enemy areas with indirect fire. U.S. forces in Iraq effectively used guided munitions to destroy enemy positions in battles in Basra, Sadr City, Fallujah, and Mosul. Although damage was considerable, it was far less than, than that inflicted by less discreet use of firepower in city fighting in previous wars. But however it is delivered, Firepower is essential to win an urban fight. In the Philippines in 1945, General Douglas MacArthur wanted to preserve Manila and initially forbade use of artillery and airstrikes in the capital. Increasing American casualties forced him to rescind the order and allow at least artillery to be used in the fighting. The Japanese soon faced increasing use of firepower and died to the last man defending the city against American assaults. However it is waged, urban warfare is grim business. After American forces seized Manila, MacArthur arrived to reinstate the Filipino government into power. As he began his speech, he looked out over the sea of destruction before him, the ruins of a city in which he had lived before the war and that had once been called the Pearl of the Orient. He broke down in tears and finished his speech by reciting the Lord's Prayer. He then left Manila never to return. Thank you very much. Good. Interesting. All right, uh, thank you very much. Um, it's always fun when, you, when the panelists uh, disagree with one, one another, so we'll leave yeah, now for something completely different. Um, analysts of any era are wanted to exaggerate the uniqueness of their own historic strategic predicament. It's human nature. Nowadays, they generally consider themselves to be in the very eye of a storm brought about by the most recent historical inflection point, uh, an oft-mooted switch from an industrial society to a highly informationalized post industrial one. And they find, therefore, that combined with the issues of scale of urbanization, which is men mentioned uh, uh, already the, this morning uh, and yesterday evening as well, uh, that they are especially beleaguered as a result. This is wrong, though. The issues are not new, and even the ones that would seem so, for instance, the prevalence and density of uh, media, which we are uh, sometimes assured is changing war's very nature, are really only superficially different. A couple of examples uh, serve to illustrate the case. Consider this scene uh, from Flavius, Flavius Josephus's The Jewish War, which recounts an episode from the siege of Jerusalem in 70, uh, 69, 70 AD by Roman legions under the command of Titus, who was son of the emperor uh, Vespasian. Think of it as a news report. Threatening death to any of the populace who would breathe a word about surrender and butchering all who even spoke casually about peace, they attacked the Romans who had entered. They, being the Jews, attacked the Romans who had entered. Some confronted them in the streets, some assailed them from the houses, while others, rushing forth without the wall through the upper gates, so disconcerted the guards at the ramparts that they sprang down from their towers and retreated to their camp. 
Loud cries arose from those within who were surrounded by enemies on all sides and from those without in alarm for their comrades who had been left behind. The Jews, constantly increasing in numbers and possessing many advantages in their knowledge of the streets, wounded many of the enemy and drove them before them by repeated charges, while the Romans continued to resist, mainly from sheer necessity, as they could not escape in mass owing to the narrowness of the breach. And had not Titus brought up fresh support, all who had entered would probably have been cut down. Stationing his archers at the end of the streets and taking post himself where the enemy was in the greatest force, he kept them at bay with missiles. Domitius Sabinus, who in this engagement, as in others, showed himself a brave man aiding his exertions. Caesar held his ground, plying his AC-130s incessantly, I mean arrows incessantly, and checking the advance of the Jews until the last of the soldiers had retired. I suggest that this, that this battle involved swords and clubs, and not M4s and AK-47s, matters little. Just replace archers and arrows with close combat attack and armed aviation, and the scene has, a, I think, an obvious contemporary resonance. And in some other ways, also, the tactics of the Jews differed little from those of, say, Islamic State insurgents more recently in the months-long months battle for Mosul. Uh, zealots amongst Jerusalem's defenders did indeed murder most of the moderate leaders of the Jewish community and actually burnt the city's dry food supply on the logic that would have fed the population for a year or two on the logic that this would compel non-combatants to join the fight. Uh, in fact, it only compounded the tragedy of defeat by Rome since m many of the inhabitants of the city had di already died by starvation when the city fell, uh, as did die uh, subsequently through collective punishment by the Romans, which was quite severe. The wider political complexity of the campaign and its distinct and immediate connections to politics at the center of Roman power are equally noteworthy. At the time of the battle, uh, Vespasian had been emperor for only a year, uh, and the defeat of a Roman army, uh, especially one commanded by his son, would greatly have undermined his political position. Uh, he, uh, this was coming after the year of four emperor, of the year of four uh, emperors, uh, which was a bad time in, in <coughs> Russian uh, Roman domestic politics. Bear in mind also that Josephus Flavius was hardly an objective historian. He was rather a, a hagiographer, famously described as the Jewish Benedict Arnold. He was quite literally owned by T Titus and conscious of the need to preserve and advance the celebrity generalship of his master. Thus, we have to read between the lines of his account to see what he's actually describing in that scene is a tactical blunder by Titus, who screwed up. Titus should never have advanced his troops at the point he did through such a small breach. He should have been a bit more patient and enlarged it. He was rescued from his tactical uh, mistake by a competent subordinate, a strategic corporal, after, uh, if you will, um, plus artillery. Actually, he was in this room. It was 20, just over 20 years ago that the term strategic corporal was coined by um, uh, Charles Krulak, probably speaking right from this podium. So it's often said that one of, in fact, I think this conference is predicated on the idea that one of the, the an important reason for examining urban operations now is that they have the potential to become a critical security issue in the 21st century on account of inter alia, demographic trends, globalization, powerful non-state ad adversaries, and so on. Uh, cities are, moreover, it's said, not just politically but, uh, but also economically significant as base points in a world-spanning web of organization of production and markets, which obviously conflicts within them would disrupt. The thing is, though, that this potential of urban operations, in every sense that it is suggested, suggested may become pertinent in the 21st century, whether to resonate rapidly uh, and powerfully in international politics, to cause ruction in uh, global markets, or, in, or to impact the mood of distant populations has been actual for at least two centuries, possibly two millennia. 
For instance, in late June uh, of 18, 1806, my last example, just over a half year and half a world away from Nelson's great victory over the French and Spanish fleet at Trafalgar, British forces under the command of Admiral Sir Home, Hop Sir Home Popham landed at the Rio de la Plata, Argentina, aiming to capture Buenos Aires and ultimately to seize one of the greatest and richest uh, Spanish colonies in South America. It wasn't a strategically planned gambit. In fact, Popham was acting independently on his own judgment as a commander, which was not wholly unusual in, given the technology of communications of the day in the context of a global conflict. He had convinced himself that the people of the region were groaning under the tyranny of Spain and they, that they were eager for liberation. He also considered that there was an opportunity here to counter allied setbacks which had occurred in the European theater, notably Napoleon's victory at the Battle of Austerlitz in December of 1805, with a splendid little war in, in the South Atlantic. Ministers in London across the street, however, uh, were really not pleased uh, when they learned uh, of the event. They considered that he had vastly overexceeded his, uh, his authority. Uh, <coughs> their fury, however, was largely assuaged by the initially extremely congenial results. A superior Spanish military force was quickly routed at the cost of a handful of British casualties, and Buenos Aires was occupied on the march in a kind of thunder run, uh, really. The Times editorialized uh, triumphantly on the, on the fact. Um, I suppose if we had aircraft carriers on the t at the time, somebody would have stand stood on the deck of it beneath the banner saying, mission accomplished, proclaiming the end of major combat, combat operations. The then vast sum of $1,086,000 was sent back to, Brit to Britain by frigate, which was nice to have, alongside... Uh, lots of other uh, booty, uh, Jesuit's bark, for example, and anti-malarial mercury and things like that. A large quantity of arms and ammunition was seized um, uh, from Spanish armories. Financial markets in the city of London soared uh, on anticipation that the good times would roll. Uh, unfortunately, however, the mood of buoyancy was not to last. Indeed, Practically by the time that these treasures were landing uh, in Britain and reinforcements had already been dispatched to, uh, to Popham, events in theatre had begun to turn decidedly for the worst. The British, it's true obviously that the British did plunder the assets of the uh, deposed Spanish uh, regime, but otherwise they took some care to operate uh, in a population-centric manner, not to exasperate the local population. Private property was untouched. Um, the population was, uh, uh, was assured that they had been liberated, not conquered, and that their rights were protected. Local government, courts, tax authorities were all permitted to continue as normal. And the place of the Catholic Church in society was unmolested, although uh, there would have, that would have been a, a distinctly alien faith to the bulk of uh, the British uh, soldiery. It was to little avail, however. Firstly, the improvisational nature of the whole campaign uh, flavored, the, uh, flavored the mood or colored the mood of the population uh, which had been liberated or conquered as you see it. They, even those locals who were happy to see the end of Spanish rule, and there were many, began to doubt the long-term intentions of the British, uh, right? Are these guys really going to stick around? Secondly, a powerful insurgency was organized under the skillful command of a, of a uh, Spanish general, a knight of the Order uh, of, of Malta in the service of Spain, out of a rag bag of soldiers, bitter enders, uh, civilians, and gauchos, uh, Argentine cowboys. The result was a bitter humiliation of British, British arms, which resulted in the court-martial of the officer in charge of operations. Ironically, not Popham, uh, who, was good, who was savvy in this way, who escaped immediate blame by moving on uh, to uh, bright, greener pastures before the end game, but General John Whitelock, uh, who had arrived in May of 1807 with a small army of 6,000 troops under orders to recover the worsening situation with another assault on Buenos Aires. But the fighting in the town and suburbs of Buenos Aires proved insurmountably difficult for the British. 
who discovered that the thick walls, the flat roofs uh, of the Spanish colonial urban landscape, cut through by narrow alleys, turned the place into a practically endless series of discontinuous ambushes that broke up their, their formations and uh, impeded their uh, efforts in every way. In scenes reminiscent of Titus's premature foray into Jerusalem, they were assaulted from the roofs by a great proportion of the population with hand grenades, musket fire, stones, boiling water, while seemingly at the turning of every street corner, when they moved into the, the major streets, the boulevards, they found that they were blasted by Spanish cannons, which had been which were loaded with grape shot and stationed behind uh, ditches and barricades that they couldn't cross. The mood of the aftermath was recorded by a British officer who uh, wrote in his diaries, we were ordered to march out without arms. It was a bitter task. Everyone felt it. The men were all in tears. We were marched through the town to the fort. Nothing could be more mortifying than our passage through the streets amid the rabble who had conquered us. <laughs> the war is generally unremembered now by Britons, uh, though not Argent Argentinians, for whom it was a precursor to uh, revolution and independent nation building. It was indubitably uh, hybrid, although to use a, a popular current term of reference, according to an, an objective understanding of that concept's main underpinnings. Certainly there was a mix of regular and irregular modes of warfare. It also included the exploitation of clan, tribal, uh, and illicit networks for the sustainment of the insurgent fighting forces. The final battles on the streets of, of Buenos Aires featured a mix of the most primitive arms deployed al alongside what then were really cutting edge ones, grape shot, for example, canister, uh, uh, which was a new device. Cunning savagery, continuous improvise, improvisation, rampant or organizational adaptation, all of that. The Spanish commander de Ligniers achieved the operational and tactical fusion of these things in the same battle space, though it would not have been described as such in those days. And this is to say nothing of the political complexity of the conflict, which had tendrils linking events of a nature local to the theater, such as the three-way tension between Spanish colonial rulers, indigenous peoples, and their British liberators come conquerors, into governments in Paris, Madrid, and London, not to mention wa uh, Washington. The Americans were watching with a wary eye what the British were doing in South America. Um, equally, there was the interaction of the conflict with financial markets. Which, uh, boom and, which boomed and busted on this event. There was, too, a media dimension, first in the enthusiastic celebration of Popham, who was uh, applauded in the press as a military genius. He was very acutely conscious of his own celebrity. celebrity. And as the war progressed, second, with the public uh, and rather very humiliating pillorying of General Whitelock. So if I say... <laughs> In conclusion, if I say that there is little new in today's world that has not been seen and dealt with in the past, that is not to say that there is nothing new, nor moreover if I say that present day strategists tend to exaggerate how greatly they are affected by the connectedness, complexity, and sheer chanciness of the world relative to their forebears, that is not to say that they don't, or you don't, face conundrums. It is rather, in my view, that we are better placed to, do, to deal with conundrums if we are clear about what is new and what is not, and do not sever ourselves from the experience and knowledge of the past. Thank you. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here today. I'm a bit of a late addition to the program as of yesterday afternoon. And uh, I'm afraid I won't indulge you with historical examples because there are enough military historians in the room, so I, wouldn't, I don't want to embarrass myself. So I'd rather focus on some of the findings of the work that my organization, the IISS, has been doing recently in partnership with the International Committee of the Red Cross. We've been doing some work looking at the conduct of war in cities and implications for uh, humanitarian actors. 
So my role today is really to discuss the uh, human dimension of urban conflict and also discuss some of the challenges that the various actors that operate in urban theatres are uh, currently uh, facing. Uh, the impact of recent wars, especially in the Middle East, has been largely concentrated in, uh, in cities. Uh, the Syrian civil war and the uh, international campaign against the Islamic State, both in Syria and in Iraq, have caused Im immense devastation. And cities such as Raqqa, Mosul, and part of Aleppo have been left in ruins. Uh, this destruction has also raised awareness of, the longer term, uh, of a longer-term challenge. Many countries that are currently facing protracted conflict or that are recovering from conflict are also facing rapid and often unmanaged urbanization. This realization has prompted a rethink of responses to armed conflict in cities, both in terms of humanitarian actions and also in terms of long-term policies for security and development. And indeed, what we, uh, we noticed through our work is that there is a growing consensus among practitioners that responses to armed conflict should go beyond short-term uh, aid, and instead they should lay the groundwork to deal with long-term urbanization challenges. But let me say a few words about the challenge at the hand. Let's first look at Raqqa, what was the, um, the capital uh, of the uh, so-called Islamic State. Raqqa was once home to half a million people and then in turn turned into a land of rubble and death. No building seems to have left untouched by the ISIS operations or the Western-led bombings. Some, well, approximately 80% of the city has suffered some damage. And, accord, and the uh, newly established Raqqa Civil Council faces enormous challenges to rebuild roads, rebuild bridges, uh, and, and various infrastructures to ensure that people have homes to go back to, to reopen schools, and also to secure that water and electricity supply are, uh, are re-established. And aid is clearly um, in insufficient. And what, what one could also extrapolate is that the longer these services remain unavailable, the greater the frustration of the people is going to be. And this could even perhaps lead to social unrest uh, as a result. An additional problem that we face in this uh, context is the very high number of bodies that are lie under the rubbles. Those need to be removed as soon as possible to avoid the risk of diseases. According, again, to the Raqqa uh, Council of Volunteers, the, they will need about 10 million euros, uh, so 10 million dollars a year for the foreseeable uh, future in order to rebuild the city and ensure that all services are uh, reinstated. If we now look at Mosul in, in Iraq, the battle to retake Mosul was described as hell on earth by the United Nations humanitarian chief. And this indeed is another, another striking example of the damage caused by, uh, by conflict in urban environments. It is estimated that about $1 billion is needed for the reconstruction of Mosul alone. 15 out of the 54 residential districts were severely damaged and 23 were moderately uh, affected. And Mexan Saint Frontier has compared the damage suffered in Mosul to the blitz of the Second World War. The other problem is that there are plenty of civilians that are in need of medical health, but hospitals are either non-operational or have been uh, destroyed. And the absence of clean water in a number of districts make the health situation even worse. There is also an issue that uh, that is uh, clear and is evident across all the examples that we have heard uh, today is the issue of stress and trauma experienced by the civilian uh, population. This is going to have an, a long-lasting impact uh, on people who have witnessed horrific levels of violence. The most vulnerable, as you can imagine, are children. And in Mosul, it is estimated that 90% of children have suffered the loss of at least one loved one. They've also not been able to go to school for some three years, and then all those schools have now been reopened. Many children are, are unable to go back to schools because they've become the sole breadwinners of their families. And this links to a broader uh, problem that is pertinent to many of these contexts, and it has to do with the so-called uh, brain drain. You know, those who can have left the country, uh, and the children, the, the young people who have remained, are not getting a sufficiently uh, high quality uh, education, and this will have a long-term impact for the reconstruction of the country and the, uh, and the social capital. 
of the country once the, uh, the hostilities end. And all these things I've mentioned are those that we can describe as indirect or reverberating effects of conflict, which I would argue sometimes have even more detrimental impact than the direct impact of, of, of conflict. But the urban challenge is not only pertinent to those areas affected by uh, ISIS uh, violence. According to the International Committee of the Red Cross, uh, in 2015, 50 million people worldwide were affected by various forms of armed conflict in cities, 50 million. In addition to this, we should also bear in mind that 60% of the urban population in low income as well as conflict affected or fragile countries currently live in, city, in, in, in slums within cities. And those are areas where the governments have little presence. Informal uh, governance and also informal economies have become the norm. And non-state actors, including gangs and criminals and sometimes violent extremists, have set up their bases and created parallel, uh, parallel structures, we make it, which make it harder to establish regular economies and to reinstate uh, governance. One issue also that has affected cities in an enormous uh, way has to do with human displacement. As you know, in recent years, we've seen unprecedented levels of conflict-driven uh, human displacement. We have seen millions of interna internally displaced persons and, and refugees escaping from areas of conflict. Most of those uh, civilians who escape don't end up living in refugee camps. They tend to find uh, safety, or some sort of safety, in cities. And usually these are cities in developing and already fragile countries, which means that the arrival of this new influx of civilians puts uh, additional uh, stress on the already fragile infrastructure of some of the receiving countries. And it also has the uh, risk of altering the identity of those cities and those countries and generating discontent among the uh, local population. To give you a sense of the, uh, of the proportions, in Jordan, for instance, refugees represent 30% of the total population. So you can imagine if you're a Jordanian trying to find a place in a hospital, you might get frustrated when you see uh, refugees or foreigners who actually take your, take your spot. And this might create some social, social tension. So cities we have established are very complex environments in which you conduct humanitarian and military uh, operations. They are very interconnected uh, areas uh, and they're, they're also very, uh, they're very dense. One thing that characterizes the security situation in cities is also the high level of uncertainty. There is the blurring distinction between civilians and combatants. There are questions regarding which laws and norms apply in an urban uh, environment. And also the, there is the realization that violence in city has begun to resemble conflict situations. For instance, I'm thinking here about the so-called gang wars in Central America. While conflict itself has become more urban, even in predominantly urban, rural sorry, uh, countries such as Afghanistan. It is clear from you know, my own work and of course from today's discussion that the uh, the concept of urban warfare is hardly a new one from the point of view of military uh, practitioners like yourselves. The fundamentals, especially at the tactical levels, have not uh, changed uh, that much, and the idea of killing a city by cutting its flows uh, as part of a military campaign had been tested on a number of, uh, of theaters, albeit with some, of course, um, improvements and, and, change, and changes. However, if we look at the, uh, at the humanitarian actors, the situation is a bit different because humanitarian organizations are still shifting or still trying to shift their approach for the traditional focus on rural setting to urban centers. This change has been prompted predominantly by, the change, by changing conflict trends over the past 10 to 15 years when a number of, con of conflicts have erupted in middle income and more urbanized uh, countries such as those in the Middle East and also, for instance, the, the Ukraine. Um, some, uh, some of these specific challenges of metropolitan areas are evident in places such as Mogadishu, in, in, in Somalia, which has faced uh, decades of war and insurgencies and have challenged really the, 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 the traditionally rural oriented approach of humanitarian agencies. Or we have seen, uh, for instance, the case of, or the case of, of Yemen, where the, co the current cholera uh, outbreak has been a direct result of the impact of, of war on the country's already uh, precarious health, uh, health system. <coughs> 
If we look at what can be done and how these actors can, 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 can work and operate in these situations and hopefully make uh, things better, uh, one thing that has emerged from our project is really the importance of local engagement. What we see traditionally is that lots of these uh, efforts are channeled through national level institutions. And there is very little engagement with municipal and local authorities who uh, uh, arguably have a greater understanding of what the local needs are, what the local priorities and dynamics are and they had a better place to, uh, to enforce and, and deploy the so-called area-based approach, i.e. an approach that is directly tailor tailored to a specific <coughs> environment. The other point that also came across very strongly in our own discussions is that uh, the responses should also include uh, NGOs and the expert community. And at the same time, it should also include many different uh, sectors to include the military and security actors, but also humanitarian development, but also urban planning, architects, uh, uh, and so on. One thing that experts have also begun to, uh, to argue is that development and emergency responses uh, are actually converging and development efforts should start while a conflict is still ongoing. So to, to, to give you an example, one way of doing this would be by uh, helping set up water supply systems in a given place rather than distributing bottled water. So in other words, development becomes uh, part of the response to conflict. Obviously, cooperation among all these different actors brings some challenges vis-a-vis -vis the sequencing of responses, also the availability of resources and the sustainability of efforts. The competition among different agencies, we, all, we are all very familiar with various institutional terms. And also sustaining efforts in light of changing political priorities, both on the ground and in uh, donor uh, countries. There is also the risk that the presence of many different international organizations and actors actually ends up fragmenting uh, local communities. So it, uh, we think it's very important to develop that mutual trust and understanding among the different actors, uh, especially between the military and non-military uh, non uh, agencies. And it's also important to really ensure that this cooperation and understanding basically just talking to one another started during peacetime so that when a conflict or a crisis erupt, those different agencies are better prepared to, uh, to work together. One recommendation that emerged from our work, it would be for the military, for military forces to have sockets in which humanitarian uh, organization could be plugged is it to, so that when a conflict starts, they could easily uh, work together. And a final uh, point would be, in also in this respect, is to be to organize multi-agency uh, training uh, exercises to, the, uh, to familiarize these different agencies with working together in an urban environment so that they are better prepared for future challenges. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, sirs, moms, um, clearly it's a privilege for me to address this audience on this subject. And um, this comes with a health warning that uh, I often say things that frequently upset people. Um, my engagement with the British Army, um, and I should clarify um, my, my status in terms of a military career. Um, the words former Gobby Lance Corporal massively overstates my military accomplishments. And, so my engagement with the British Army um, has primarily been red teaming since about 2012 on the issues of command, doctrine, and capability. And clearly, urban operations has, uh, has, has formed part of that, uh, whether it's um, looking at uh, how um, divisional CPXs have chosen to plan and uh, engage in terms of um, invading what seems to be the same city over and over again, and some of you will know exactly which piece of terrain I'm talking about, um, or uh, looking at the uh, various um, iterations of urban doctrine. Now, I am not gonna belittle urban operations. Urban operations are incredibly hard. Everything you've heard today, even though there is not 100% disagreement, is largely true. Um, so, it's clearly demanding. So what? There are lots of operating environments that are very, very demanding. War doesn't change. 
war has an immutable quality. Warfare cannot change at a rate that we cannot understand it. It's a human artifact. The conduct of war always should be understood by the people conducting it, fairly obviously. Politics can change all the times in ways you can't guess or predict or have an understanding of the consequences of your actions. So that pretty much sums up, in my view, complexity, whether it's from 70 AD or to 2035, arbitrary date picked in the future for no reason at all. So essentially, an army doesn't know, well, an expeditionary army um, doesn't know who it's going to fight, doesn't know when it's going to fight, doesn't know where, and it doesn't know why. It's got to be pretty certain about how, because if you're asked to fight, you can't, you can't make how up. You at least have to have a default position. So on the 1st of February 2005, in other words, 13 years and a day ago, I was speaking at an urban ops conference. Sitting at the desk next to me was Lieutenant Colonel David Kilcullen. He presented a paper called um, Complex Warfighting Version 3, and I presented a paper called The Land of Hollow Rocks. I thought it was a sexy, interesting title. I've since ditched being interesting. And everything that, thank you, <laughs> tough, tough audience, everything that you guys are going to address was addressed in that conference 13 years ago. Just some of the examples were different. Everyone was saying Mogadishu, Sarajevo, no one was yet then saying Raqqa, okay? People were saying Ramallah, nobody was saying Gaza. Well, some people were saying Gaza. Let's go back even further. In 1982, the army, British army, conducted a series of experiments called King's Ride in the Ruleben, uh, uh, Ruleben Urban Training Area of Berlin. And part of that uh, exercise was to validate historical analysis with instrumented urban trials. You can all go away and find, if you're prepared to pay whoever holds the report for the report, that the, uh, that the outcome of that was that instrumented trials validated the historical analysis. One of the interesting points about the historical analysis, with both the trials and the historical analysis, threw up two interesting things. One is it's all about training. The more people do urban operations, the better they become at them. Shock horror. Who saw that coming? The other point, which was within the 70 odd example, European examples that um, uh, then DERA, I think it was, had access to and the 40 Burmese or Far East examples they had, the defender usually lost and lost heavily. Now you can say, and I can admit that if you extend that, um, if you extend that sample to China or Vietnam or wherever, you would come up with a different figure. But these figures weren't arbitrary, and, in the time, and, and using the experimentation norms of the time, clearly you would have to go back and examine the underlying data. But here's a simple fact. As of the mid-1980s, the British Army had two clear opinions. One, it knew how to do urban ops. It knew how to do instrumented trials to trial new ideas and new concepts. And it had some good historical analysis validated by trials that said if we do the following things, the following <laughs> things should happen. Those of you who say, ah, but I have read the uh, King's Ride um, uh, trials report, and it doesn't say that, I would say just go away and find a book um, written called, uh, um, written by one of the trials officers, and sorry, I've just completely, uh, the, the title has, um, has, has slipped my mind, which lays out that regardless of what was said in the trials report, this was the opinion that the trials officers came away with, and that then informed a whole series of trials in BAOR. It was done by the Berlin Brigade. The Berlin Brigade had one, one specialization, fighting in Berlin, and they painted tanks in that regard. That has since re-emerged. But that wasn't the only urban dedicated force that BAOR had. There was also a Territorial Army Parachute Brigade based in, I think, Hildesheim, um, who did nothing. But uh, in fact, if I remember correctly, General, weren't you the ops officer for that? Right, there we go. I knew you had a connection with it somewhere. Um, the, I think the ops officer is in the audience. Um, so clearly, Again, 
come to the end of the 1980s, we'd practiced a lot of urban, we knew a lot about it, or at least we thought we did, and we had every reason to feel reasonably confident. In the mid-1990s, or even before, uh, the urban operations wing was set up. That presided, provided a full integrated urban training course from section to at least unit, and I believe it would have been theoretically possible to run multiple unit level exercises across multiple sites in the UK to test the various levels of command and control and the urban skills and drills. There was Cope Hill Down, which you all know, and there were numerous other sites across the UK scaled for either section, platoon, or subunit. Fast forward to 2011, and there is a judgment that the British Army is not ready for urban ops. I don't know where that judgment came from. It was very publicly made. You were all in the army, well, at least the vast, vast majority of you were in the army when it was made. But the British Army was no longer ready for urban ops. This kicked off Exercise Urban Warrior, which concluded at least two years ago. And I would imagine that the output of that would be that a regain to the training of the 1990s and the level of confidence in the 1990s that did exist with a few additions that would flow out of what Urban Warrior generated in terms of insights. And you have the insights or a collection of the findings um, in, your, in, in, in your pack. In other words, there isn't much mystery here. There isn't much that is not known. Everything that was said about the fighting in Manila resonated with everybody in this audience who's aware of the fighting in Raqqa and various other parts of the Far East. Middle East, sorry. Um, so that brings me swift, swift, swiftly on to what has changed, and if it has changed, how has the training changed? Because I would assume the change is apparent, it should be apparent, because a lot of money has been invested in looking at the problem. Now, I'm an Israeli. I know I don't sound Israeli. Um, and no, I haven't seen McMafia, before anybody asks. Seems to cause again. Um, I know roughly who's being talked about, don't worry. So, the biggest shock the Israeli army has had in recent years was the Lebanon. Not a lot of the fighting in the Lebanon, not a lot, some was in the urban. But the part of the Lebanon that was mostly fought over is large towns, villages, very rarely come across a building more than two stories high. Quite a lot of the buildings are dispersed. You can go from primary jungle in a nakal, in a wadi that's flooded, to a shopping mall within the space of 100 meters. It is truly complex terrain. And apparently, one of the nastiest things you can get to fight in is an orchard. Um, everything a meter below the ground is completely open. If you stand up, you're in thick forests. Nothing. It's orchards wherever thus. If you look at the Israeli army in detail in terms of what they're prepared to share openly, um, in terms of equipment capabilities, there isn't a lot of unique equipment capabilities. They might do some clever things, but having a 70-ton armored personnel carrier buys you something. Having all-tracked vehicles might mean that you churn up hard-packed um, uh, um, hard dirt streets into uh, swamps in a matter of a couple of passes of a vehicle. So clearly there's swings and roundabouts. But the fact is there's enough evidence to make a judgment as to when to use a 70-ton armored vehicle and when not to. If you haven't got a 70-ton armored vehicle, you will have to do things differently. But the gun on a Merkava still elevates to 20 degrees and depresses to 10. That's pretty much it. Remote weapon stations still do what remote weapon stations do all over the world. There isn't much mystery. Clearly, precision, proportionality, and discrimination all matter. Killing the wrong people for the wrong reasons in the wrong place will have a negative diplomatic and political effect. We all know this. That's not a mystery. Law of armed conflict and ROE are two different things. ROE is going to be a product of policy. Law of armed conflict is going to be a product of international law. Legitimacy, in my view, a narrative is merely political opinion. If you want to argue with me about the right and the wrong things to do in the urban environment, I would say, why don't we have something we can all argue about like Brexit or Big Brother? There's rules. And sometimes those rules go away because of military necessity or because of the policy necessity. So I'm not telling you 
that it doesn't matter. I'm just saying everybody's going to have a different opinion on that, and your opinion is going to alter by who you are fighting. If you are fighting ISIS, the battle is going to go in a very different way than if you're fighting a regular conventional force in the urban terrain. And notably, a lot of what we've talked about is fighting irregulars in the urban terrain. We might like to think about other regular armies or peer plus competitors who are probably not optimally configured to fight in urban terrain, would choose to fight in urban terrain or not fight at all. So in conclusion, I don't think you've got an urban operations problem. I don't think anyone's got an urban operations problem. If there's a problem, you've got an operations problem. It's not about the urban, it's about other things. This is not about what it's about. It might be about money. It might be about an army looking for something to train towards that would give it a definite objective. I don't know. In terms of what this audience I'm speaking to right now, I'm agnostic. I might form an opinion later on. If there is a problem, the problem isn't the problem, it's a symptom of a bigger problem. And that might affect more than one army. It might affect several armies, and all of those armies might have different problems. But purely there's a simple fact, gentlemen, I'll leave you with, which is that I was on a, I was on a podium 13 years ago, more than that, so was Professor Dr. Kilcullen, and we were having the same conversation. I would have hoped 13 years later things had evolved to the degree where the conversation had moved on. Because otherwise, in another 13 years' time, me as a very elderly man indeed, will be back here saying the same thing. Round's complete. Uh, thank you very much indeed for that. I mean, there are, I think there are a number of you know, common themes that emerged through the the course of uh, the presentations around um, the nature of the terrain and its um, impact on operations and the impact of firepower on it, um, the impact on and of the civilian population, both in the short and long term, the combined armed natures of operations and specialist capabilities that are required, the impact of politics and governments, governance, and of course the intense nature of urban operations. But I think as to what is new and what isn't, uh, what is unique and what isn't, uh, and what is the exact nature of our problem, there's clearly a range of opinions which I'm sure you'll like to explore in the question and answer session, which I would now like to um, open up. Um, just a reminder, we'll conduct it as we did before, and as a reminder, the session is off the record to encourage a, um, you know, a full and frank discussion. So who would like to go first? Yeah, should we start at the back, and then we'll come to the middle here next, please. <laughs> 